So uh, thanks for all of you for sticking around so late for a, kind of one of the later panels in the day. Um, we have an interesting topic and a great panel to discuss it with. Um, to open it up, I think um, many of us that come to an event like STEP are really focused on disruption. We think about disruption. We live in disruption. We invest in disruption. And we em embrace disruption because we think it helps propel history forward. And we're all kind of enthusiastic about it. But maybe it's time to pause and think about what the impact of disruption is on a socioeconomic level and what it means for our societies going forward. I think 2016 was a very interesting year um, in terms of what the impact of disruption uh, can, can have on the very real world of politics, going from the abstract to the real world. Um, we saw the election of Donald Trump, and we saw um, Brexit in the UK. Uh, and many would attribute that to the forces of automation dislocating labor outside of the market, out, out of the marketplace, and causing all sorts of negative impacts on society as a whole, and leaving people outside of economic growth. Um, so if this is just the first step in, 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 if automation is only the very first step in this type of disruption, what is the impact of AI in the long run? Um, so with that, I'd like the panel to introduce themselves, starting with Omar. If you could talk a little bit about yourself and, and where you're coming from. Hi, my name is Omar Tawakul. I uh, run a company called WorkFit that builds uh, Eva and Enterprise Voice AI. Think of it similar to like Alexa, but for the enterprise. She can talk to you, take commands, and take notes in your meetings, help you run meetings, and update enterprise systems. And before that, I run uh, the Oracle Data Cloud, uh, which was uh, kind of the largest business unit uh, of uh, selling data in the marketplace in the United States. Great. So my name is uh, David Durante. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Narrativa. Uh, Narrativa uses AI to transform structural data into a narrative in natural language, in Arabic, in English, in Spanish. And we work mainly for the media industry. So we generate news uh, automatically, or machine uh, learning generates news. And we work also for the e-commerce, specifically in this region, and we generate automatically. Without human intervention, we generate product descriptions. Ramzi. Hey, um, I'm Ramzi. I am uh, one of the founders of a company called I Am. We're a Berlin-based photography and technology company. And what we do is we aim empower a global community of photographers, over 20 million photographers, to connect with brands and agencies, make money with their photos, get exhibited, get published, and so on. Um, and in order to do that, in order to be able to handle the mass volume of content that, that normal people generate, we had to teach machines to understand everything about photography from what is in a photo to whether a photo is beautiful or not, whether it's commercially viable or not, and, and how to improve it. So we've basically um, built algorithms, AI, that uh, completely understand imagery. So um, maybe to kick us off, during the 19th century, um, and with the advent of the Industrial Revolution, there was a lot of job creation, but a lot of job destruction. The net impact of this over the long run, I think, is inarguably very positive. If you look at the beginning of the 20th century, um, most peop the, the most common form of employment was domestic workers, for example. But the forces of industrialization has, has made that very different today. So when we think about AI um, today, can you see a net positive in the long run, or, or, do we, or do we stop and learn how to love our robot overlords? <laughs> yeah, I, I think there's a couple of things you have to take into account. Back in the uh, 19th century, um, you know, there was this group called the Luddites who reacted yeah. to the automation. And over time, it, it proved they were essentially wrong. More jobs were created than destroyed. But back then, what you, were ha what you were doing was automation was taking low-skilled workers and allowing them to produce the same output of an artisan. And so you, you reduce the gap between highly skilled and low-skilled workers, which is very advantageous for the middle class. In the current automation trend, the opposite is happening. What you're doing is your AI and automation is helping very highly skilled workers, uh, as it is today, and it's destroying the jobs of the lower skilled workers, and it's destroying the middle class. And that is a problem, and that's a really big problem. And so I think the thesis is we have to reverse that trend by creating a type of AI that is more like an exoskeleton than a robot, meaning it helps people do their jobs rather than destroys their jobs. 
a lot of AI today is more in the robot category, in the destroy jobs area, but some AI is in the category of helping people do their jobs better, and that's the type of AI that we need more of. Right. Yeah, so I, I, think, I think I agree with what you say. But I think that the, one of the biggest differences between what is happening now and what happened like centuries ago or last, last century is that the change is happening so fast. And it's like when you put, uh, I haven't done it, but I heard it's like this. When you put a frog in a pot full of water, when you hit it yeah. very slowly, the frog is going to die. But when you hit it very, very quickly, very fast, and the, the water starts boiling fast, the, the frog will jump out. Yeah? So I think this is what is going to happen now. The change is going to be so, it's, it's been so fast that everybody's perceiving that, OK, my job is really in risk, and I'm going to do something about this. So even if I'm negative about some of the effects of uh, what is coming, I think just because the change is happening so fast, I think people are going to realize Okay, I have to do something, I have to do it now. So you don't, you, you think it is a real risk or you think it's just a perceived risk? I think it, it, it is a risk for, for, in general, for everybody. Not only uh, low skilled yeah. jobs, but also high, highly skilled jobs. I mean, we are suspected in some journalists. Right. I don't know, so, but I think the risk is not as big as it was like centuries ago. Because it's not I, as big. It's not as big, because it's okay. so fast. that. People have to react, yeah. not so in what, a lifetime. But what, what about, I mean, to challenge you on this, like, um, think about the trucking industry, for example. So the trucking industry in the US is, a, is a lo one of the largest single employers. Uh, I think it employs about in the range of 2 million people. Um, you can flip the switch on automated, car, on automated trucking, like, in a day, and you make everyone redundant immediately. There's no time lag, right? Like, so, you know, whereas in the 19th century with the Industrial Revolution, you know, it took a while for the capital to formulate around building out the textile industries and, you know, so that took, that took almost 100 years, right? But literally within five years, we may not have a trucking industry. So what do you do with the, the two million people? You know, I, I, as I say, I think some of them will be very affected. But I think it's just, just because, I mean, I was, the other day I was talking with one of my friends. He has a, a sock. It's uh, sports shops, yeah? They sell, uh, they sell shoes, running shoes, and so on. And I asked him, so what are you going to do with the online? You know, it's killing your business. And he's like, well, but, you know, OK, I'm going to try to be in the game for five, 10 years, and then let's see. Yeah. That's the problem. He doesn't see the urgency. So I think the fact that they, they, many people see that there is an urgency because next year they might not have a job, yeah. it, it's going to mitigate a little bit the effects of uh, yeah, of that, that's the, the impact of AI, you know. So I'm not so negative on this. So R R Ramzi, you're, you're shaking your head. What? <laughs> I, I, I have a lot of opinions, unfortunately. Um, so with regards to the trucking industry in particular, I think it's a very, very relevant point. The industry itself has a shortage of workers. There's more people leaving the workforce than entering it. And this is not before look at, looking at automation. So in the next 10, 15 years, there won't be enough people to drive all the trucks that need driving. So that's not really the problem. It's sort of the second order of businesses that are built around that industry that, that will suffer. Um, so me personally, I think, I think you said one thing very relevant, which is a lot of the turmoil we're experiencing today is because of automation. A lot of people still don't realize it. They, you know, they'd rather blame foreigners or, or you know, Mexicans or Muslims, or, but the real enemy is actually us and, and the stuff that we're creating. That being said, um, I want to go back a couple hundred years before the 19th century, since we're, since we're right. going through history. There's this notion I recently read about called the, the, um, the white Protestant work ethic. And um, the whole idea was that you work hard every day and you get rewarded. It's sort of the American dream. You, you go to work every day in the morning, you come back home, your wife, three kids are sitting there, you have a car in the driveway, blah, blah, blah. The, the whole notion of work, though, has changed. It's working smarter, not longer. And we've been talking about that for a long time at conferences, and it's, it's a really sexy notion of, you know, it's not about how, much, how many hours you put in. I think automation, the way we're looking at it, there's not going to be AI robot overlords for quite a long time. That's really just hyped up bullshit that people talk about. Um, what we're talking about are very specialized algorithms that do very specific things better than humans. 
And unless you want to go and unravel the entire mechanics of capitalism, which everyone here believes in, because pretty much everyone here has a smartphone, um, which is efficiency. Unless right. you want to unravel that, you have to you have to let it go. You have to let machines do jobs that they are better at doing than humans. In my mind, I'm, I'm on the short term. I'm very pessimistic. I think the world will suffer for this. In the midterm, I'm I'm quite uh, ambivalent, and I think the long term, I'm quite optimistic, for the simple reason that if you think of Maslow's pyramid of of needs, mm. the whole notion of self-actualization, the notion of decoupling work from sustenance. Sure. of not having to work to survive. You work because you do something you love and you survive because there is value generated. And if it's machines generating it, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. I think it's Assuming quite Assuming the machines long -term don't the enslave us first. Well, the machines can think. That's the whole point, right? I think we don't even understand what human intelligence is. Yeah. And we're sitting here. There, there are literally 100 definitions of what human intelligence means. And we're sitting here talking about artificial intelligence. It's buzz. It's buzz because it's sexy, because it gets investors to put money in and it gets people to adopt yeah. these technologies. But AI, as we know it, is really closer to brute force statistics than it is yeah. to an actual intelligence that thinks for itself. Great. So I think that's a great segue in our next point, which is like there's a lot of you know, um, public perception around AI a certain way. And you, know, you can take the dystopian view and take it up to the nth degree, and you get to a you know, very bad place. But I mean, you guys work in this. You guys live it. And you guys breathe it. I mean, what are the big differences between the perception of AI that you see in the mass media versus what the reality is? You know, how, how, what, what does it look? How, what is the difference? What are the points of similarity? Well, I think one of, the, one of the points I was trying to get at before is this idea of AI that helps you do things better as opposed to replacing you. So if you look at um, kind of there was a panel, there was someone um, up here talking about helping in surgery uh, using virtual reality. Sure. Um, that's enabling a set of applications that couldn't have been enabled without it. It's the same thing with AI. You know, we're building tools to help you uh, take notes in the meetings and take actions. There's nobody who has that job today and the job doesn't get done well. And, uh, and so if you think of all these tools that let you do exoskeletons, so that they're, they're actually startups doing exoskeletons, right? right? People couldn't walk, and all of a sudden now they have an exoskeleton that lets them walk better. I think there's a whole class of AI that, that produces value. Uh, again, when you go back to Google, there wasn't someone in your company who did search, right? right. In general, Google enabled this whole category. Uh, and I think that's the aspect of AI that people most have wrong because fear sells and it's easy to concentrate on fear. So I think, I think the biggest misconception about AI that I have experienced, I mean, I've done research in AI for four yep. years, uh, 15 years ago, <laughs> when nobody talked about AI. Uh, the biggest um, misconception is that AI, as we understand it, as we know it, as we know it today, and I think for a long time, is very narrow. We are able to, to build systems, technologies, that get very good at something very specific. And, and they get as, as good as humans, or even better. But this is a narrow AI, self-driving cars. It's amazing what they do, but don't ask them to identify, I don't know, to know if this is water or is, um, I don't know, wine. You know, they, so they are very good at very, something very specific. So. Um, when you talk about AI, people think that, oh, it's like incredible, can do everything. No, it's not true. Can do something really, can do something very specific very well, but that's it. And I think to get to more broad AI, like really intelligent systems that can um, understand and take decisions about different uh, scenarios, different topics, I think it's going to happen in maybe 100 years or more. So this yeah. is the biggest misconception today, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I totally agree that, uh, that that sort of divide between um, strong AI or, or AGI, as, as, it, as it's called, and narrow AI is something that most people don't recognize. Um, again, I think the understanding of the brain, we don't understand the brain yet. And the whole approach of you know, thinking we just have more machines and more machines, uh, and, and at some point we'll be able to model the entire neural network of the brain, is not going to be the way forward. It's, again, brute force. So that's... Um, so I think people miss, uh, definitely, definitely exaggerate what AGI is. Um, and most of the techniques we use today are actually 40, 50 years old. Mm. And back then they were saying, 
uh, real AI will be there in 30 years. Today they're saying a real AI will be there in 30 years. It's a yeah. sliding window that hasn't changed. <laughs> um, but on the other hand, I think people, you know, so people definitely exaggerate and don't understand what that means. Data, everyone talks about big data um, as if you just take a truckload of, of hard drives, plug them into a machine and, and build stuff. Data is a very, very complex thing, and even though we have a lot of data, it still needs to be cleaned and labeled and structured and so on most of the time. So that's the one side of it. On the other side of it, most people don't realize that um, with the current technologies that we have, I mean, who here thinks that AI can do their job better than them today? Uh, maybe me. I mean, like, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Who, who thinks I can, I can see a world where, like, you know, I'm redundant pretty quick. Well, yeah. You know? I mean, who, who thinks AI will be better at their job? in five years? No one. Well, one person. That's two. That's kind of scary, because it's actually probably most of our jobs. Um, and I think this is what people sort of always under, underestimate. Uh, there's, this, there's this thing on, on the robotics side of the world called uh, the uncanny valley. Yeah. And that notion of a robot is almost human, but that there's this one percent that kind of makes it feel off. And that is where I would say a lot of these uh, uh, narrow AI applications are when they write music, when they write poems, when they, when they create buildings, and when they design chairs, right. they're, they're off, slightly off. But, but that divide will be bridged, and I think it will lead to entire societies changing. It will change how we think, how we live every single day. And that's happening without robots yeah. flying around and, and feeding sure. us to their machines, right? And you know, and on this concept of the kind of the sentient robot or the sentient AI, you know, uh, you know, Amar, what do you think? What, when is the singularity? When do we get to that point? I mean, we, different people were saying different things. What, what's your what's yeah, your view I, on this? I don't really have a well-formed view there because I think we will. Um, we, we as a race are not mature enough for the technology we're building, so we're more likely to kill each other way before we get to a singularity. Like I, I, I think. We'll, <laughs> I'm not worried at all yeah. that the singularity is actually going to take us over. I think what we're going to do is we're going to create so much job disruption that you're going to have like all these nationalistic leaders who are going to get their people to be angry at other people, and we'll have wars, and we'll have a much lower tech right. uh, set of problems than we will from, like, I think a singularity is a pipe dream. I don't think it's that. People talk about it in, in like 30, 40 years. I think again, it's sliding 30, 40 it's years. Been, yeah. It's been 30, 40 years for the past yeah. 40, 50 years. Yeah. Um, and I, I totally agree. I think, I think sentience, again, we don't understand human sentience, and I don't think machines will work the same way. Right. Um, and honestly, like, if, if we want to bring it back to business today, every single company is trying to do something with AI. You need to, to have a business case and you need to solve a problem, and that should be the, or sure. that is our focus. Yeah, yeah, totally. I, I love fantasizing about that stuff. I read Asimov, and I'm, I'm amazed at yeah. sort of a lot of the interesting things that the guy wrote 60, 70 years ago about how machines will lead to the rise of nationalism. It's, it's in his novels, it's ridiculous, right. but this is fantasy and fun, and we're solving real world problems today yeah. that are helping people, and I think that's, that's sort of how I look at it. So, I, I think that. I think that you, you made a point very valid. It's like, I mean, uh, today the, the, the AI, especially when it comes to machine learning or deep learning, is basically, uh, I mean, as you say, they started 30 years ago. Basically, they try to replicate how the human brain works. But it's just so limited what we have achieved. And I think till the point where when we really understand how our brain works, yeah. we will not be able to replicate it in a machine, so we will not be able to get to the point of uh, having sentiments and all this. So I think it's more a question of um, understanding first how our brain works and then try to replicate it at, I, full, I, at full scale. I, I think the future is going to be more of a, of a merger between men okay. and machines, people and machines. Um, and again, there's always that, that example. If you go back 4,000 years into the past and you look at the people living there and then, you would have pretty much nothing in similar with them. You would be effectively an alien to their, right. to their, to the, in, in, in their notions and their perceptions. And I think the future will be the same. And uh, it will empower us. It will be sort of the next evolutionary step for mankind. Doesn't mean that, uh, that we're making ourselves yeah. extinct. We're just evolving. And if I have a machine that, that is yeah. smarter and helps me be creative at, at 10x the speed and, and, uh, and you know, 100 times more, more efficiently, 
that's that's more the, the optimistic future that I have. So if we take the optimistic future out, I think everyone more or less agrees that in the short run you can have some forms of disruption, right? So what, and and that, how do you combat some of the negative aspects of that disruption in the forms of the rise of nationalism, in the form of the rise of kind of um, massive social upheaval? What are the right approaches in terms of policy prescriptions you would think about? Yeah. As a way to deal with it, is it like Bill Gates taxing the machines, or is it, or is it UBI, or is no, it? No, I, I, again, I think it's on focusing on creating exoskeleton-like value, which is you know you enhance people's memory, you enhance their accuracy and they're doing their jobs, you enhance their efficiency and their speed and they're doing their jobs. So that's number one. Um, number two, you need to um, you need to have a policy around retraining because one of the problems that you brought up, I think, is, is really acute is that we're creating innovations in faster and faster cycles than we are before, which means that the people whose jobs are getting dislocated have less and less time to adapt to new jobs. So part of the policy has to be to, to really spend an actual percentage of the GDP in making sure that workers are able to get retrained in other areas, or else you're going to have that, that, that kind of growing you know, uh, workforce that's uh, obsolete. So focus on exoskeleton and not robots, and uh, retrain your workers and have a budget to do so. I, I, I kind of disagree with the retraining side of it. Um, this isn't teaching people who are screwing in, uh, uh, you know, screws into, into carriages how to do it to cars. You can't take an assembly line worker and teach them how to train neural networks. That's not realistic. And that's why I said short term, I'm very pessimistic, because there will be people who are unemployed. UBI, uh, by the way, do, do you guys know what UBI is? Yeah. It's Are you universal basic income? It's this, this idea that everyone should get a base salary that they can at least live off of without having to work because the state, through automation, whatever, is generating enough, enough uh, value. So UBI is an interesting notion and one that has been talked about at length. But UBI is also super challenging because, uh, well, one, there's a lot of resistance to it because it's socialism and in capitalist societies that's kind of, even though protectionism is also a form of socialism by reducing efficiency to, to guarantee workplaces. Uh, so UBI is kind of a challenging one and on a more human emotional level, which is why I'm pessimistic, it goes into the whole self-worth of, of a person. If you tell them yeah. you will never have a job again, here's some money to live off of. And that, to me, is why I think education is the key. I think people need to, and I think the new generation is kind of uh, uh, prepared for this. They are comfortable switching jobs, they're comfortable retraining, they're comfortable adapting. Um, but by the time that new generation becomes sort of the majority and becomes like the right. main workforce, I think we're going to have 20, 30 years that are, that are very, very turbulent. Uh, I would say, I would say three, three simple things. First, awareness. So everybody needs to know what is coming. Even if they will not be directly affected, they, they will be indirectly affected. So for awareness, everybody, governments, right. institutions, companies, they have to make sure that, this, that people understand what is coming. Second, the governments and institutions need to give the tools to help them to retrain, to do, you know, to sustain their life standards. So, but third, and the most important, it will be a personal choice. So everybody will have to decide, OK, do I, st do I stay here living out of uh, government money, or do I go learn something new, and I try to do something new? So I think there will be so-called losers and winners, yeah. as it happened 100 so, years ago, 200 years ago. Um, we only have a couple of minutes left, but in closing, um, you know, on the more positive side, what are the more exciting things in terms of the applications of AI that you're, you're excited about? What are you looking for in the future? Basically, you're going to enhance people's creativity because you're going to take them away from the time that they spend doing drudge work, and you're going to let the machine to do that for them, which has always been the core uh, idea of automation. But you know, you're someone who spends you know, half of your time in meetings our goal would be to say, we're going to clean up all the follow-ups so that whenever you speak, we remember it, we actually take the actions for you, we email the people, we send out the doc, we update salesforce.com, we close out your action items, giving you time to actually do the work you enjoy. So I think all across the enterprise, you're going to see a lot of AI you know, removing the drudgery and allowing you to elevate your time into more creative work.
I think all the, all the applications and technologies that are helping to make a better world in the broad sense, you know, the, so helping with healthcare in remote areas, helping with uh, social fairness, with uh, something very important that information or real information get spread around. You know, all these applications are very exciting for me. And I, this is uh, the ultimate goal, I, I think, for right. the technology to, so to, obviously we all need to make profits and make money, but to have an impact on societies. Yeah, I mean, I mean, from the technological side, I think the benefits are, are clear, right? Healthcare, less people dying because of car crashes, uh, affordable, everything. But to me, to me personally, I think the more exciting thing is the fact that in the last hundred years or so since the Industrial Revolution, there's this whole rat race notion of work, 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 and that's your purpose. And I think we lose a lot of the, the sort of more valuable, deeper, the deeper um, ambitions that we have, sure. writing a book, discovering an author, uh, traveling the world, experiencing things because all of the crap that we'd have to do day to day is being taken care of. And to me, I think, I think we're going into sort of a new renaissance, a golden age of, of, of creation and creativity by getting rid of all of that, uh, that life admin, if you want to call it. Excellent. I think that's generally all we have uh, time for. Um, but I'd like to thank our excellent panel on ending on a very positive note. So would you all just put your hands together and, and help thank our panel for that. Thank you very much.